you. Uh, everyone coming in, can you please mute yourself? All right. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Bryson White and I'm the Regional Faith Coordinator for Faith in the Valley. Faith in the Valley and our community partners believe a different, better future is possible for the Central Valley if we work together by building power through relationships that challenge structural inequality in the Central Valley. A future in which everyone is included, treated as sacred, has a chance to thrive and live a healthy and decent life. Today, we are excited to begin our Justice Revival Lecture Series. In 2022, we'll be hosting a series of conversations with academics, clergy, and movement leaders to explore a range of pressing justice issues and the role religious power plays in shaping our society. Speakers will, speakers will help participants think about the relationships between faith and social movements to inform our current efforts for change across the Central Valley. Today, I'm very excited to begin our series with Dr. Reggie Williams. Reggie Williams is Professor of Christian Ethics at McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. He does work at the intersection of Black theology, Blackness studies, aesthetics, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer studies. Williams' book, Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus, Harlem Renaissance, Theology, and an Ethic of Resistance, published by Baylor University Press, examines the impact of exposure to Black Christianity in Harlem, New York during the Harlem Renaissance on the German pastor and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was killed by the Nazis in 1945 for his activism against them. Dr. Williams' currently work, cur current work explores Blackness studies to examine the ethical claims of Christian anthropology and the theology of Bonhoeffer. Dr. Williams and his wife, Stacy Williams, are the parent of, of a son, Darian, and a daughter, Simone. A bit of housekeeping uh, before Dr. Williams uh, takes, this, uh, takes the stage is to, to please place any questions that you may have in the chat here in Zoom. If you're here with us on Zoom and if you're on Facebook, please place the chats, uh, your question in the chat on Facebook on the Faith in the Valley uh, Facebook page and we will see too that your question will be answered. Right, so we'll begin with a 30 minute lecture by Dr. Williams and then hold a 30 minute uh, question and answer session. So it's on you, uh, Dr. Williams, take it away. Thank you, Dr. White, uh, Professor White. Wonderful to be with you all. I'm from this um, San Joaquin Valley, I should mention. Went to high school in Manteca. I live now in Chicago with my wife and our children are dispersed momentarily. So we are momentarily empty nesters. You, if you've uh, been an empty nester, you know how that goes when I say momentarily, because they keep coming back. Um, wonderful to be with you all. And so what I'm planning to do here is to offer a bit of reflection. Um, I'm going to be uh, reading something and then um, stopping momentarily to explain pieces of what I'm reading while also showing you some slides. I plan to do most of the slides up front. But the point that I'm going to be making, um, it comes from the uh, West African concept term Sankofa. Um, it is represented by a bird that is reaching back, feet play, face forward. The bird's beak is reaching back and it's got a little egg in it. If you've seen the Sankofa bird, it's got a little egg in it. Um, the point is to go back and retrieve from moving forward. But the interesting thing about this bird is that the egg is fragile. So if you grasp it too hard, you can lose it, meaning it crush it, crushes it. But if you don't grasp it hard enough, you can drop it and you lose it and it crushes it. So we know we need to have the right relationship with what we're reaching for as we are moving forward. So keep that in mind. This is a Sankofa moment, in, specifically in relationship to the civil rights movement. Um, so I, I'm talking about in this relationship, this reach, go back and get it, um, remember, uh, go back, reaching back and getting for moving forward, a dilemma that is in fact no dilemma, but highlights the birth of a problem that describes life together in the United States. This, I, I plan to offer an example of a historical struggle to change the meaning of being together in this country. 
that would have us collectively recalibrate our understanding of human and Christian from false ideals. It's recalibrated from false ideals that harm each of us and community towards actual life with actual people and healthier notions of community for the meaning of our struggle today. So in short, this is about a dilemma. That's really not a dilemma, but a, re a, a harmful calibration of humanity and community to, for us to take into consideration for what we are doing today and what we intend to do today. So here we go. The narrative of human difference that we know today as racial hierarchy was introduced during the transatlantic slave trade and at the beginning of the United States in the 17th and 18th century. It is a what's what scholars describe as a biopolitical organizing scheme. Now, biopolitics is referencing work by uh, French philosopher Michel Foucault, who talks about the change from fighting and organizing society at the will of the sovereign monarch towards organizing society for the collective, from the collective without the sovereign monarch. Life power, community power. But this race is a biopolitical, meaning a communal organizing scheme. And what I would describe as a financially incentivized anthropology, because the slave trade was lucrative. It serves to stabilize white masculinity as the divine ideal and the template for humanity. I'm gonna show you a few slides here because this is going to, this is gonna to relate to what, I'm, what we're doing here. So, um, the narrative of human difference as racial hierarchy introduced in the slave trade is a biopolitical organizing scheme. It organizes society based on the concept of an ideal. What is ideal? Ideal is a conception of something in its absolute perfection. So claims of perfection are part of this ideal, this concept of an ideal. Ideal is one that is regarded as a standard or model of perfection or excellence. An ultimate object of endeavor or goal, an honorable or worthy principle or aim. Here, this is a reference to a concept of an ideal. You recognize this as Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, which when this is put together, da Vinci was actually speaking about a math problem. How do you fit a square inside of a circle? Can it be done? In short, the answer to this math problem is the dimensions, the perfect dimensions of the perfect person, perfect dimensions of the human body. Here, it's setting up an ideal. What is the perfect human body? White male, European. This is developed prior to, just prior to the age of discovery in the 15th century. So they have this concept in mind of the ideal body as they head out in discovery and encounter bodies that are aesthetically different than the ideal. So they start creating knowledge of these biological, these, these differences. They also have in mind the concept of them, Europeans, as Christians. Christ as human, then representing the ideal human. This representation of the resurrection in, from the 18th century is depicting um, the modest and perfect human community. Women in angelic um, idealized feminine depictions, kneeling at the feet of the sovereign who has riven, risen in all power. And you can't see here, because the picture is cut off, of what these Easter lilies, um, which you can see, but you can't see down here, is that the soldier, the one opposing the Christ figure here, has been crushed. It's bloody down here with a sword. Um, it's a very, it's a different picture of the gospel's narrative. This is representing something of the aesthetic of that time in human difference and power. This depiction of the march westward 
of progress, manifest destiny here is represented as, again, an angelic, perfectly proportioned white woman carrying learn knowledge with the book in her right hand and technology with these wires in her left, light pushing out the darkness. And the darkness are the darker bodies of the Native Americans here, of the natives, as colonialism pushes westward. This, this spiritualizing of Western idealized bodies who bring with them the ideal of community and of goodness and of holiness. It's also represented in current contemporary depictions as well. You, remind, you might um, recognize this um, recent depiction, movie depiction of Superman, uh, Man of Steel. Here in this moment when he's debating, contemplating through agony on giving himself up to this bad guy who's come from his homeland. When he's, he sits in a church agonizing over this, they're wanting to make sure that you recognize the connection between this perfectly proportioned, beautiful, all powerful male figure and Christ over his right shoulder. Just before that moment, actually after that moment, I'm sorry, in the chronologically in the movie, after that moment, here's this moment when his father tells him, you can save them, the world, you can save them all. He stretches out his hands in a cross, in a figure like he's on the cross, superimposed over the planet as he flies down to save them all. This perfectly proportioned, aesthetically um, identified as white and real American figure is a Christ figure. And Christ serves as the head, or I should say, as the religious representation of a hierarchy of human beings. And these humans, these holy ones, culturally, I mean, cultured and civilized and religious, spread and get, spread the culture, spread culture and civilization to save the world. And here's a local manifestation of this idealized figure. I move through those quickly. I can put those back up as we move forward. But I wanted to show you that this is all meant to describe the intrinsic goodness and divinity of the white ideal. That's what's at stake here. White supremacy, race-based slavery, and the writing of the Declaration of Independence were dependent upon this aesthetic notion of good and holy. They were ideals born in the same moment. White supremacy, race-based slavery, writing of Declaration of Independence were all born in the same moment, in the same Western spaces, ironically with the same intent, the hope of human flourishing. That's the, that's the intent. In her book titled Our Declaration, Harvard professor Danielle Allen tells us that the concepts of liberty and equality were not at odds with one another as commonly depicted in contemporary political discourse. The concept of liberty is often preferred over equality by right-leaning politicians because of a shared misunderstanding or distortion that to promote equality is to encourage government intrusion upon individual liberties. Liberty or individual freedoms becomes the go-to standard for American ideals over and against the concept of equality. Professor Allen argues that this binary does not represent the intent of the declaration where liberty was meant as the prerequisite for equality and the two are mutually dependent. The claim that all men are created equal was a statement of resistance to tyranny. They were asserting their God-given rights over and against despotism from their monarch, the King of Great Britain. The claim that all men are created equal, says Allen, appeals to foundational human desires for mutually recognized agency. Each, as she says, has the capacity to engage through talk 
in a project of responsiveness to make sure that none is encroaching on the sphere of, an, of any other, on the sphere of agency of another. The achievement of freedom, she claims, depends on this egalitarian engagement in a constant recalibration to undo or redress or fix encroachments. Put differently, equality or recognition of our shared agency is not possible without freedom. Freedom to represent my wishes, my pain, my hopes, and to have you respond to my wishes in a morally responsible way in recognition of shared humanity. That understanding makes sense of the lofty ideals stated in the Declaration of Universal Human Rights to Life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. This is much more than sentimental rhetoric. These are claims rooted in lofty ideals that defy tyranny and oppression and gave birth to a great world project of collective agency, as she says, and co-responsibility, that is US democracy. That is precisely what Martin Luther King Jr. would later argue. This is, I, I, I hasten to say I'm representing what Professor Allen is saying in her text. Yet there is great irony present as I recount this part of the story of the struggle for independence that she's writing about. The irony of the Declaration of Independence is that the men who wrote the document and signed it also enslaved black people. They bought, sold, and owned people of African descent as material property. When they made the claim, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, they were also openly practicing the denial of self-evident rights in their colonies, on their land, and in their homes. What did they mean by the demands for liberty and equality if they don't own those values themselves? Danielle Allen argues that it was a problem of inconsistency. Interestingly, King does too, which they were aware of and that they wrestled with it, some of them even signaling initial intent to address the contradiction. Yet they remained active participants in the system of buying, selling, and owning Black people. As I see it, this was not a matter of inconsistency. This was something much more sinister. In 1944, the Swedish sociologist Gunnar Myrtle called this an American dilemma. That was the name of his book. The slave-owning founders were political activists for the acknowledgement and embrace of universal liberty and equality. This duplicity obviously placed the founding fathers at odds with their most sacred national creeds. It was a tremendous irony that this same freedom-loving nation founded upon the lofty enlightenment principles of inalienable rights, of freedom and equality was birthed as a slave-owning nation, granting citizen and inalienable right, citizenship and inalienable rights to whites only. Gunnar Myrtle argues, that this nefarious predicament was due to their logic of race, which is strange fruit of the very lofty principles of freedom and equality that they were so that were so treasured by the founders of the nation. The irony here is distressing. The principles of freedom and equality served to oppose the logic of race with its dogma of white supremacy and black inferiority. Yet those very principles ultimately invoked the insidious codes of white supremacy and black subhumanity in order to justify bare-faced disloyalty to the principles. Their duplicity, the duplicity was not a dilemma. They were this, they, they spoke in this way. In a white racist society, the language of freedom and equality forced the logic of race, as Gunnar Myrtle argues, quote, the need for racism is a need for defense on the part of Americans against their own national creed, against their own American cherished ideals. I, I jump down here to make, to summarize here, what the, the Swedish sociologist is arguing is that when they make the claim, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. 
what they're saying is all humans are created equal. That in order to do that, in order to make that claim and hold on to their slaves, they had to have a subhuman status. They had to classify these people as subhuman in order to argue for the morality of their cause. To make, we are a moral people. I mean, be, people tend to be uh, want to argue for the morality, the just, just of the just nature of their cause. They want to argue for that. So they create, they created this subcategory of human being in order to hold on to the lofty principles of liberty and justice. Hence, there was no dilemma. All reference to human being was was and remains to this day reference to an ideal being, one that is recognized as white only. Turning human difference into racial categories was done to stabilize one type, the main type, as ascendant and ideal, the white landowning male. In practical terms, this idealized concept of human beings operates according to stereotypes that lead us to believe that we can know one another in the abstract. Real, actual human social contact is unimportant or of lesser value in comparison to the ideas of one another that racism has crafted for us, fashioning for our imagination the stereotyped ideals of community populated with ideal people. Many of us are left longing for Mayberry. Now, um, I grew up watching the Andy Griffith show, so that concept, that, that phrase longing for Mayberry may be lost for some, so I'll show you some pictures. That, that, this, that, Dr. Williams, really quickly, can you move your screen? Uh, oh, that you're doing another PowerPoint. There we go. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> what, um, you, you needed me to move the screen when I... Bryson? It's fine now, it's just, we couldn't see your face, uh, but now that you're showing another PowerPoint, it's perfectly fine. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'll stop sharing the screen in just a moment so you can see my face. Um, the ideal community. The concept of an ideal is supported by rhetoric, by aesthetics, cultural aesthetics that feed the concept from all different aspects of society. The television show here, Andy, Andy Griffith's television show, is representing the con this ideal as something that everybody should want. It's wholesome. It's good. And the very nature of good is something that we should all want. It inhabits our desires, telling us what we ought to want and what we ought to be about. Who wouldn't want this? The police force in, the, in Mayberry doesn't do any work. They have no real reason to work. There's no crime there. Don't you want a community where there's no crime? Everybody knows each name, everybody's name. We, rep we recognize and respect our elders and Aunt B makes great pies. The May in Mayberry, they don't need to, I mean, there's one person who goes to jail and he checks himself in when he's had a couple of too many drinks. Other than that, we don't have much work to do. Now, you also recognize who populates Mayberry. And the, um, the nature of community in Mayberry, it's worth fighting for. It is imperative then, or reasonable, that we should, ex should, we should invite violence or have the need for violence in order to make sure that this community is intact in its intrinsic goodness. Racism made the nation dependent on abstract ideals of people to guide our moral interactions, which leaves us generally incapable of addressing one another in the real world as real people. Mayberry's not real, and neither are those people. And if it was, why should we want that instead of the, hum the, uh, the way that society is actually constructed? Um, Martin Luther King Jr. wanted the U.S. government to be true to what they said on paper with the liberty and justice for all regarding the lofty ideals. But given what race told the authors of the declaration, we might ask, what is the truth in America? I move on here now to a little dis a short discourse on Martin Luther King Jr. 
The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. wanted us to deal with that question. What is the truth in America? He wanted us to deal with that question in live, real, live interactions. He remains one of history's most important public theologians. Politicians and private citizens around the world have gone to great lengths to acknowledge his history shaping impact, his history shaping impact, since he was assassinated in April of 1968 at age 39. In 1964, he was the youngest ever recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize at age 35, and the second African-American to receive that recognition. Only the second. There are more than 100 K through 12 schools all over the country that carry his name, and it's estimated that nearly a thousand streets in the US alone are named for him. Dr. King is widely recognized as the, by the recorded sound of his voice, and his legacy is invoked at the mention of a phrase, I have a dream. He is a towering historical figure, a champion of the modern American civil rights movement. We must also, however, I hasten to say we must acknowledge that while he is undisputably the most prominent voice emerging from that movement in the 50s and 60s, he was a public interpreter of a black tradition of protest in the land of the Declaration of Independence that is historically populated with a myriad of groups and leaders. A fitting assessment of Dr. King must recognize him and the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s as a manifestation of the black hope for freedom and justice that existed well before King and remains ongoing. King's family refused the allegations, his whole family did, the allegations of whiteness that whiteness made about the world and the place of black people in it. Those assertions meant that in spite of the nation's claims of Christianity, human rights and freedom and liberty, black people have no rights that white people are obliged to respect. The plight of black people on these shores is the practical implications of a centuries long national habituation in a biopolitical organizing scheme. Again, I reference biopolitics here, um, the modern invention of power organized for the maintenance of social of society as a whole, rather than on behalf of the sovereign. I just, I, I need to make that clean, clear to try and lessen the jargon. So um, the way black people experience life on these shores is the practical implications of centuries long national habituation in biopolitics that makes the bodies and even the families of black people fair game as targets of white lust for ownership and domination. I should, I, I, I need to say also that when I'm referring to whiteness, I'm not talking about something that is a part of any racial identity. Whiteness is not necessarily speaking about white people, something that is, that, that is a quality of white people. Much the same as blackness is not a quality of black people. To say whiteness is to talk about the historical process of developing the world as racialized. You see it when we come into contact with actual Africans or with, Afri with Af actual Native Americans. They're not red as whiteness describes them. They're, uh, they're um, Cherokee. You know, Apache, in various tribal groupings. And we know them based on, we, we, can, we can acknowledge them, you know, the land that we exist on today as member, as uh, the First Nations land of such and such tribe, not red people. That is a categorization by whiteness. The West Africans, they're not black people. Their identity was taken from the land and the traditions and placed on their skin as black when they were initially, they are in fact Ashanti, Akopon, um, Fanti, you know, and so forth. Whiteness creates red and yellow, black and white. In the in the assortment of human beings and a, in a racial categorization, as an argument for a hierarchy that places white people at the top and black as the nadir. I say that in the paper here that I'm reading. Whiteness is an organizing scheme. It is a body of discourse 
in discourse, by, by discourse, I mean a conversation that creates reality. Um, a species of reality that reproduces itself as timeless truth. We don't know anything different. We believe that this is just the way things are. It has the seeds of procreation internal to itself. Meanness and persecution are not the main traits of this ideology. It makes meaning and is productive. So the whole sense, the whole meaning of Mayberry makes perfect sense. To people, it reproduces the logic with everything that comes with the society where that is normal way of understanding human difference. Other things that reproduce logics and power, I mean, for take for example, um, some scholars say that you stop at the stop sign um, in case there's a cop watching. But the fear of a cop watching has you policing yourself. Um, and there's also things that we desire, for example, uh, that we're made to desire that are just kind of natural to, to life in the West or in the United States. It makes meaning and is productive. It populates our desires and demands our loyalty. Like parthenogenesis, here's a vocabulary word for the day. It's a science, but scientific vocabulary word, parthenogenesis. Um, this is life generated without male-female reproductive contact. Certain insects produce parthogen parthenogenically, genetically. They don't have interaction with another of their species. They are like virgin birds regularly. Whiteness is like that. It creates its own reproductive logic so that you have lots of people arguing for this as what should be. It reproduces itself by itself, creating gatekeepers for itself who will maintain it as a logical narrative of human hierarchy, imparting societies with a continued obsession for white racial ascendancy over everything related to earth and heaven. Whiteness is the self-sustaining ideology that makes white supremacy legible. It generates knowledge of human difference, capturing all of humanity by, its, by an account of racial types that is replete with portrayals that make the types knowable in the abstract and arranging them as a hierarchy of being with white at the apex or the top and black at the nadir or the bottom. And the fact that to many it is logical is the source, is why it remains so violent, because it makes sense to them. I would argue that it's not logical. It is full of contradictions. From chattel slavery to separate but equal, in its multiple ongoing manifestations, whiteness is an epistemolo epistemological, no, epistemology is the science of knowledge of knowledge production and justifying belief. It creates knowledge and it justifies itself. Um, it's fundamentally an argument for ownership and belonging, whiteness is. It teaches a hierarchy of human difference, a system of social valuing for a, com for a community that we should all want in a world that is based on one's supposed ability or inability to properly possess one's self, your body, and the land on which you live. You see that um, in the way politics distributes um, property around your city. That these people are terrible on property and they are immoral with their bodies, where these people over here uh, treat property well and possess their bodies in a moral way, and we should have them in leadership. Let, never mind the fact that um, whiteness also describes who gets political benefits. How, how just poly resources are, are distributed in the city. Proper possession is a capacity that is recognized aesthetically by one's positioning within the hierarchy of human difference and is key to the plot in the script of our life together. King's family knew of this script, its history and its disfiguring implications for black people. Whiteness includes a religious ideology that recognizes Jesus as the aesthetic figurehead, as I showed you earlier, 
at the apex of the hierarchy of human difference with the term human being or fully human as hegemonic concept for whites only. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s community inheritance, meaning he, can, he inherited this tradition of protest, included a Christian response to whiteness. He was raised in a tradition of black abolitionist Christianity, within which he was the third generation of Baptist preachers and Morehouse alumni that included his maternal grandfather, A.D. Williams, and Daddy King. Within the community of believers that King's tradition called faithful, Christian life was intrinsically social, meaning you can't just talk me and Jesus. This is social. It was cal calibrated by a connection with Jesus in suffering and an interpretation as opposed to um, connection with him risen with all power. Connection with Jesus was made in this tradition for King in suffering, and an interpretation of God with us in the struggle against troubles all over this world. Some of you may recognize the song I'm talking about there. He was what scholars identify as a black social, he was, he was what scholars identify, he was representative of what scholars identify as the black social gospel, rooted within black abolitionist religion and the teaching of the Bible that God favors the poor and the oppressed. The Black social gospel saw eternal salvation paired with a this world focus on the dignity of Black people, where matters like race determine social value as the, as the way one must think through the meaning of the gospel. I'm going to show you this quote here. Bryson, how much time have, have I got here? I, I meant to have my clock started. It's 7.06, uh, we wanna give some space for, for, for questions. So uh, uh, so potentially you can wrap up in 10 minutes and then we can uh, open up for okay. q and Okay. Quote, here we go. The full-fledged black social gospel stood for social justice, religion, and modern critical consciousness. It combined an emphasis on black dignity and personhood of protest activism for racial justice a comprehensive social justice agenda, an insistence that authentic Christian faith is incompatible, incompatible with, racial, with racial prejudice, an emphasis on the social ethical teaching of Jesus, and an acceptance, uh, an acceptance of modern scholarship and social consciousness. All right. The Christian protest tradition taught that God was concerned with our eternal soul and our embodied everyday well-being. King's inherited tradition included a lived Christian response to questions emerging from the end of the Civil War. What did abolition mean after slavery and reconstruction in the past? How should Christians respond to the mania of racial terrorism and oppression that terminated reconstruction and instituted forms of abuse? The answers to questions like these were much more than academic. They shaped the Black hope that animated Christian opposition to political and social injustice. So the rest of this is narrating a little bit of King's um, entry into the civil rights movement. I can do that real quickly by saying that he took his academic training that made sense to him from his rootedness within a tradition of protest in, social, in black social gospel. When he gets to Alabama, to Birmingham, Alabama, in the fall of 1954, there's a lot that's already been happening. A lot has happened. I'll, I'll rehearse that bit right here. 10 years prior to his arrival, in September of 1944, 24-year-old Reese Taylor was brutally raped by a group of white men while she was walking home from church in Abelville a town that's a neighbor to Montgomery within an hour's drive. Miss Rosa Parks, branch secretary of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP was dispatched to Abelville to investigate. That's 10 years prior to King's arrival. She was already, they were already doing the work and Rosa Parks was already involved. The assault against Miss Taylor was widely known in Alabama as were her white assailants, yet no arrests were, were made. So biopolitics 
kept the lives of black people within constant reach of white lust for sex and violence and outside of the moral scope of political governance. Eight years after Ms. Taylor's assault in 1952, 16-year-old Jeremiah Reeves was sentenced to death in Montgomery after police secured a forced confession from him for the alleged sexual assault of a white woman. She, in fact, was carrying on an extramarital affair with this 16-year-old black boy. And she's a married woman, full-grown woman. They forced a confession out of Jeremiah Reeves. Three years later, on March 2nd, 1955, 15-year-old Claudette Colvin was likely upset about the undressed treatment of her friend and classmate, Jeremiah Reeves, when she was physically dragged from a Montgomery City bus and arrested for refusing to comply with the bus segregation ordinance and for resisting the police. On October 15th, of that same year, Mary Louise Smith was also arrested for refusal to give up her seat to a white passenger. Incidentally, I had an opportunity, the uh, extreme privilege of actually speaking to Clyde at Coven about that arrest. Black leaders had their eyes on the city buses where its primarily black women riders were habitually mistreated. They were working on a plan to address the conditions for black bus riders prior to these two arrests. At first glance, young Colvin's arrest seemed to be the catalyst they'd been waiting until it was decided that she would no, not be the right person to inspire the black community to support a boycott. The newcomer Martin Luther King Jr. was already organizing his church to engage in social action for justice as a matter of Christian faithfulness, but he wasn't yet an active participant in plans for change on the city buses. In August of 1955, 14-year-old Emmett Till was murdered in a small town called Money in the neighboring state of Mississippi. His mother, Mamie Till, made certain that the world saw the disfiguring face of whiteness by demanding an open casket funeral for her once beautiful black son. Pictures of young Emmett's mutilated face, unrecognizable in the casket next to the photo of a once beautiful black boy went around the world as illustration of the things that white supremacists do. The images were broadcast widely enough to enrage black people across the country. Four months later, on December 1st, 1955, Miss Rosa Parks was likely thinking about young Emmett Till, in addition to the constant harassment and abuse that she and other black women were accustomed to when she refused to give up her seat to a white man on the Montgomery City bus. And with her arrest, the idea of protest became a plan. So I narrate in the rest of this, the structure of King's theological voice. It was a revolution of values, he would argue. In order to re help to recalibrate the national conscience around human being and community, he argued for a revolution of values to help shape what he described as the beloved community. He borrowed from Gandhi, the concept of Satyagraha, love force, and blended it, as he says in his book, Stride Towards Freedom, with the way of Jesus described in the Sermon on the Mount, to help create a discourse around actual and right human relationships. I would ask, what does this protest tradition guide how does this pro protest tradition guide us today? We sit within streams of thought, public Christian thought, that still flow very strongly from the civil rights movement. The Christianity that is the tradition of King sits right alongside traditions of Christianity that argued for civilization, culture, and slave ownership as social goods, Christian moral goods, that organizing society means having everybody in their right place. What is the meaning of the tradition of protest against that calibration of humanity in our time? 
how shall we live? So I had more that I would say, and I wanted to talk specifically about the revolution of values. But the other thing I would say here in closing is a king represents a history of leadership for that time, the strong leader, the single vocal leader. Today, leadership looks different. We've got multiplicity of leadership, not centralized in a charismatic single voice, but spread across the community. We must take, pay, take heed that we're not trying to hold on to this tradition in such a way that would crush it. But we also don't want to completely drop it and lose it. As we reach back to understand this tradition, we must hold it carefully and make sense of it in our time as we move forward. I'll stop there. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for your, your thoughts and, and, and reflections. Um, I'm gonna open us up to, to questions by asking my own. And, um, and then if you, for those who would like to ask questions who are on the Zoom link, uh, simply raise your hand and then I'll give you space to, to ask your question. Um, that's what the, my, my question is, um, in light of uh, your review of how whiteness is constructed and comes to shape uh, our society, what is the role of faith communities in undoing this oppressive framework? What is our role as faith practitioners? That's a good question. The role of faith practitioners in undoing is, first of all, is to recognize, you know, faith is not as I've shown here, absent from the practice of keeping whiteness as good, even sacred. Um, to claim that one follows Jesus is not to necessarily claim that, you're fault, that you are on the side of um, anti-racism, fighting social injustice. And when I say whiteness, I don't, I don't mean only race. I'm talking about um, uh, a concept of being, really, that takes race, um, class, uh, gender, sex, these things all as um, the being of the ideal. And for Christians, Jesus oftentimes becomes representative of that being, that ideal being. The problem is that this is this is where the problem of uh, the of white Jesus captures a Christian imagination and makes Christians um, soldiers, militant soldiers for evil, advocating for harm socially, politically. What we need to do is to recognize um, where we stand and what the meaning of the gospel is, and how whiteness shapes both the gospel and us. We are all caught within the, the, racial, the registers of whiteness, all of us. And we are either proactively undoing it, proactive in working against it, proactive in speaking a different language, or just falling back into the language that we're all born and habituated in, which is whiteness. And you're in faith, is one of the ways in which we speak that fluently. Religion is one of the ways we speak that fluently. You gotta be real careful, careful here. This king was not speaking the language of white Christ. It's often, it's because he was pushing back. Like people like, I, I'll go back a little further. Ida, uh, um, well, I'd say Ida, Ida, Ida Barnett, but I'm, uh, most, more specifically, um, um, Rose, why am I doing this? I can't believe this. Grandma Moses, um, good Lord, this is a this is this is a bad moment. I've written so much about her. Um, Y'all know who I'm talking about. Say a name, Bryson. I'm not sure who you're referencing either. Grandma Moses. Mm -mm. But I'll, I'll I'll find out right at I'll find out when we get off this call though. <laughs> Harriet Tubman. Thank you. Oh, Thank Harriet you. Tubman. Oh, I thought you were talking about Grandma Moses, like as in relation to Martin King. No, no, I'm talking about Harriet Tubman. I've written so much about Harriet Tubman and regularly speak on Harriet Tubman. 
I cannot, that is bad. I should get a, I should make sure I see my doctor tomorrow. But um, anyway, Harriet Tubman, who was a um, immoral, um, ungodly uh, um, offense to community and society. She was not Christian. How can you be Christian and breaking laws like that? That's the argument in opposition to her by Christians. Her community would steal away and pray even prior to um, taking black people away from slavery. Her community would steal away, sneak away and pray, risking life and limb to do so in a Christian nation. Your claims to be Christian don't mean that you're on the side of God or justice. You gotta be real careful here. She was following God, plundering an economy, breaking laws, immoral lawbreaker for Christ. How do you determine that you're on the right side of justice? What tradition do you stand in? Woe unto you when all people speak good of you. <laughs> But I don't mean like multiplying enemies for the sake of multiplying enemies, like Trumpism. But um, when you're able to value, see and, see and value your neighbor and take their life into consideration as part of God's, God's um, effort to create relationship with us so we have our eternal, well, eternal salvation in, con, in, in mind right next to your everyday well-being of your neighbor. So... I can speak. I could. Uh, I'm sorry, Bryson. I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, no, yeah, no, thank you, Doctor. It does. We, we have a, a raised hand. Um, okay. Uh, I'm not sure. I what see the, that hand. Uh, whoever raised your hand, could you please uh, ask your question? Because I'm not sure your, what your name is. Thank you. You've got to unmute. Uh, You've got to. There you go. Uh, you got to unmute. You're muted. So bottom left, bottom left corner of your screen that to turn your to turn off mute. There you go. Okay. Um, I was with SNCC in Mississippi in Holly Springs in the Freedom Summer, mm. and uh, was there registering voters. Um, I came out of Berkeley. I was a friend of SNCC, and then I had a friend who had was on the voter registration pro uh, project down there, and. Yeah, you know, we looked at, at Martin Luther King and the, uh, the SCLC as, as kind of different. You know, uh, the leadership that uh, of SNCC, uh, and I know SNCC was also in, in, in Montgomery. Um, uh, you know, they had been doing grassroots organizing. I see, I saw an evolution in King. Um, I mean, he taught a lot to Bob Moses, and I think, I mean, this is my impression, but I also saw an evolution just before he died and was murdered. Um, you know, he was, he was moving in a different direction, you know, in terms of values and economics and a much more, I think, community-based um, you know, the, you, you talk about the beloved community, um, a, a, a community of workers. He was reaching a broader uh, spectrum of, of organizing, um, in, which included faith, but went beyond right. values. My question is this, I mean, where do you think we could have been, or where do you think the direction was going at that point when he was killed, uh, number one? And then number two, something is happening today uh, through a cultural transformation. I wouldn't call it counterculture, but I just look at all the young, the youth, and I, I see stuff going on that it just gives me a lot of hope. Uh, and you know, I think faith in the valley in, in the valley is is spearheading a lot of good things. Um, but I, I just I would hope there could be more. Um, I, I guess 
organizing with other organizations mm -hmm. that are, you know, social justice, the Latinos, United Farm Workers, Cesar Chavez Foundation, Dolores Huerta Foundation. Uh, I, I, I don't see us coming together as quickly as I think we're desperately in need of coming together. So I, there's, there's a bunch of questions in that. Uh, I guess, was Martin, was Dr. King, uh, were we going, uh, what could have been, if you will? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, does that make you, sense? It does, it does, it does, it does. I hear you asking several questions. Yeah. Um, I, I, first of all, recognizing, I thank you for your work in the civil rights movement. Um, it's. Um, yeah, thank you, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's important You're to welcome. recognize that it's important important to recognize uh, that you know, there were white allies who were much as much a part of that and who actually gave their lives in that movement as well, um, just as there are white allies today. Um, How I got there is is a strange story, but yeah. I, I got there. Thank I God. tried to when I when I was publishing, I was rewriting my book, the um, my book on bon, Bonhoeffer. I yeah. wanted to tell the story um, of a white ally just to try and make some connections between um, the civil rights movement and, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, James Werg, you may, not, you may know that story. James Werg was beaten in Alabama, I believe it's in an Alabama bus stop with um, um, John Lewis and several others and his yeah. family saw they 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 learned that their son was in Alabama by the uh, newspaper cover seeing him bloodied and teeth missing at a bus stop um <laughs> so it was, it was a fascinating story uh, it was word um Marcel I, I saw your hand up I want to make sure that we get your question before but um let me just say this in response to your what, what is your name ma'am my name is Kathy Murgia Kathy Murgia okay in response to Kathy's question King started off only wanting to make accommodations within Jim Crow on the buses. He, he and the, and the uh, leaders, the city leaders uh, of the movement, the Montgomery Improvement Association, were only asking for small concessions that whites refused to give them. He later, when he was murdered in 1968, had, was preaching, was, was, um, had a sermon prepared why America might go to hell. Hmm. And he was arguing for not just um, an end to segregation and racism, but the end of militarism and materialism. Right. For the beloved community. These two thingified people, he said. Milita um, uh, the end of militarism, and he was very early against the Vietnam War, the, um, and materialism, that keeps the poor people in poverty. He, he died before being able to engage in the poor people's campaign. campaign. And his wife and uh, members of the SCLC picked up that poor people's campaign on his behalf. So the, the, the direction that the civil rights movement under the leadership of the SCLC, that wing of the civil rights movement was going, was in opposition to those poverty, to those, to those practices of uh, materialism that keep poor people impoverished and against militarism for a democratizing, a democratizing faith system. But he was very radical. He was radicalized at the end of his life. And it's important to recognize that most, people, most folks in this country hated King's guts. Now that he's safely dead, they can celebrate him. And that's important to recognize. Very important to recognize. Now that he is safely dead, he becomes a a hero. Marcel, you want to ask your question before we before we log off? Yeah, man, I was having bad internet problems, man. So I hope we can get in real quick. So early on in your presentation, um, you kind of highlighted the way that aesthetics and symbolism operate to kind of construct whiteness and, and perpetuate it. And what I got from that was sort of this this sense that it can inject into like the subconscious or the unconscious uh, of, of the person who operates within society and manifests itself in rarely, like, like the implicit biases are certain habits. And so I think the question was, do you think that 
faith-based institutions, um, if not critical of what they receive and, and, and teach can operate in the same sort of operant um, conditioning in which they perpetuate white supremacy in, through um, into the subconscious or unconscious in ways that, that continues to manifest itself and through the habitual orders that we live in. Yeah, absolutely. It's important to recognize that the system, systems of sacred that give us our values are not just within the church, um, that they are, they are present within society as value-making systems. And that aesthetic works, aesthetics work as you know, visual signaling systems that, that um, provoke, or I might say, um, guide or invoke those values that are internal to, the, to society in general. They are already there in you. Aesthetics work as signaling systems to tell you how to engage people and things. The question for us is to give to, the, the struggle is to recode the aesthetics so that the signaling system works differently. Yeah. That's, that's what aesthetics does as a full-on signaling system of um, invoking um, codes of moral engagement so that we fear some, um, we, we desire others, you know, we expect this from some and it's all done as a signaling system aesthetically. The, 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 the faith community, um, you might say, if you're just in short, puts a sharper edge on that stuff. If you don't, if you're, if you're, if you're arguing from a system of the sacred for a kind of signaling system. That helps, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I hope that does help. It does, it does. So, so when folks say, everybody knows it, um, they bring their drugs, their rapists, their murders, and some of them I suspect are good people. He's invoking in the abstract language that everybody does know, in fact, because it is encoded in the aesthetic that we, are great, we, are, we learn from birth. We can even go so far. I, I, I'm going to say this and shut up, Bryce. I know you're ready to go, but the, um, <laughs> but um, semiotics is another way of describing how um, the aesthetic works. So, um, what are semiotics? You know the word chair. I say chair. Something comes to mind when I say that. How does that word become encoded with the meaning that it has? It's just a symbol. Uh, this, uh, my desk can be that symbol. It's a desk. It doesn't have the word chair. A table, you know, a rock can be that, but it's not called chair. When, we, when I say the word chair, much like the, what happens when you see that aesthetic, it's encoded. It has meaning to it. How does it get that meaning that's attached to it, that we know it by um, reference to it or by looking at it. That's what aesthetics does. Tells us what to do when we see what we see. How to behave and think and feel even. Susan, I see your hand. Hi. Um, I was thinking about the, the right wingers and they seem to have co-opted the cross and co-opted the flag. And so I've been thinking that we can't let them have those symbols. And um, I, I know Kathy and we both live in Tehachapi. Um, I've been thinking about putting out a Black Lives Matter flag in front of my house. In Tehachapi, I hate to say this, um, I'm a little bit afraid to do that. In my little cul-de-sac, there's someone who flies the Blue Lives Matter flag all the time. Um, I was just, I was tr trying to think of how to do this, but I was thinking maybe I need to go to the police force and say, look, I just want you to know, um, I'm gonna put up this flag and, but I, I support the police. I mean, I, I, I want, um, I want people to, to follow the law, but I want, uh, Black Lives Matter 
Black lives to be affirmed and respected. I want both. Um, I was almost thinking maybe I need to fly three flags. Maybe I need to fly Black Lives Matter, the American flag, and the Blue Lives Matter. Although the Blue Lives Matter seems to be anti-Black Lives Matter. Um, I don't know. I, I thought I might bring it up to our police off, our head of police up here and just see what they thought, get the conversation going. But, um, you know, I have, I have some liberal friends who've said that when they try to demonstrate their liberalism, sometimes they're vandalized. Sometimes they get uh, these right wingers with their trucks and their American flags and their Confederate flags and their Blue Lives Matter flags doing something called coal rolling, um, where those trucks will drive up right next to the demonstrators and belch out black fumes on purpose. Um, so I recently found out that in, in Bakersfield, um, Democrats and Republicans are about 50-50 now, which makes me happy. In Tehachapi, it's about two to one. It's about two Republicans to one Democrat. And a lot of the liberals and left-wingers are closeted. And it, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with that. So. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how valuable those um, flag um, wars are. I'm not. I'm not sure how 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 important that that kind of thing is. You might say that that's the. Um, those are stickers on a package, and it's what's inside the package that matters more than the stickers. You know, uh, the wrapping, the external wrappings, or the 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 the, the you know externalities of things, where the the content that's within. Um, I'm not saying that we don't demonstrate our affinities or affiliations. I'm not saying that we don't do that. I'm just, I'm saying that whether one does that or not engaging in the flag wars doesn't really help us to pay attention to, or it doesn't say that we know much of what's going on with the intrinsic working of whiteness. The, the insidious nature of whiteness and how we are shaped by it. How I know myself, um, how I am actually participating within a tradition of protest. It may be that flying the flag in a community might be the, the nature of justice work. It may be more, it may be something more substantial than that. I would hope our democratic club could get to a a level of discussion in those kinds, what he's bringing up. Because I think, you know, we're, we're kind of like the band-aids of, you know, putting on a flag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something much more substantial that we need to be doing and we don't have a lot of time to do it. Right. I'd be afraid that someone would fly the flag and think that they've done some work. They've actually done something. Yeah, because I put up a Black Lives Matter flag. There, I'm in your face, Trump people. We've done it. Dr. Williams, it's 7:40, so we're going to conclude our, our time. Thank you so much for your reflections oh. and your comments, and for the for Thank those you. who asked who asked questions. Uh, this will be um, a house on Facebook as well as we'll upload it to our Faith in the Valley website for us to refer to. Uh, so thank you for joining us for this this first round of conversations. Uh, we'll be having conversations with academics, uh, clergy, and leaders from not just the Central Valley, but as you can see with Dr. Williams, someone from the Chicago area, with folks from across the country to think about religion and power and what that means for faith institutions and for the role of uh, organizing for power. So Dr. Williams, thank you so much for a robust conversation on the on the aesthetics of whiteness and how Martin Luther King's uh, life and ministry helps unsettle that as well as the call for us to, uh, for faith institutions to join in that participation of deconstructing um, whiteness as such. So thank you for your time and uh, we look forward to, to seeing you again. Absolutely, dear brother. Thank you. thank you for the invitation. Really good to have a conversation you. with you all. Yeah, thank Stay you. safe. Blessings to everyone. Blessings. Good night, everybody.